The subcommittee will come to order. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this hearing of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee. Today we have before us two panels as we examine the role of the Department of Defense in foreign assistance. This committee is very familiar with how the Pentagon and our men and women in uniform contribute to our national security. But it has been a while since we've discussed this topic with an interagency panel, such as the one before us today. We are very appreciative of the chance to do so, given the importance of foreign assistance in today's uncertain and complex world. The topic and timing of today's hearing is fortuitous, not just because our committee is currently negotiating with the Senate for the FY19 National Defense Authorization Act, but also because we, as a, as a nation, continue to face a myriad of challenges in conflict and post-conflict regions that will require a holistic, interagency, and whole-of-society approach to increase stability and reduce violence in many of the regions and countries we will discuss here today. This will involve the agencies that are before us now, but not exclusively. It will also require close working relationships with non-governmental organizations and non-federal entities, a large objective of today's hearing. This committee, and indeed this particular subcommittee in particular, conducts rigorous oversight of ongoing counterterrorism operations and activities in conflict and post-conflict countries, and understands firsthand the challenges that we as a nation face in Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, and Libya, to name just a few. We have continually asked hard questions in previous hearings to understand our long-term counterterrorism and security objectives and to ensure that our successes are not only of a kinetic nature. And yet, as we approach year 18 of near constant combat, it is becoming increasingly difficult to see and realize long-term and sustainable progress in many regions. How do we ensure and measure regional and strategic effects on the battlefield that contribute to security and stability? What role does foreign assistance play? And what specific role should the Department of Defense play in support of USAID and the State Department? Today's panel here is very well qualified to help guide us through these critical and important questions on national security. Welcome to our first three witnesses. Uh, starting from my left, Mr. Jason Ladner, Director of the Office of Partnership, Strategy and Communications, U.S. Department of State. Mr. Robert Jenkins, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, USAID. And Mr. Mark Mitchell, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations, Low Intensity Conflict. I'd I'd now like to recognize my friend, Ranking Member Jim Langevin of, of Rhode Island, for any opening statements you'd like to make. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik, and uh, thank you to our witnesses uh, for being here today. I look forward to, uh, to hearing your testimony. The Department of Defense personnel are found across the globe. They are witness to some of the, most, the world's most intense conflicts, worst disasters, sectarian conflicts, and humanitarian crises. Because of their proximity and skill set, when these global security challenges and disasters emerge, including some that are the result of climate change, the Department of Defense is regularly called upon to bring to bear its unique capabilities to support the humanitarian stabilization or disaster response. One of the most uh, visible examples of this support was Operation United, Ass United Assistance during the 2014-2015 Ebola crisis. Less visible is the Department's current role in the Syria transition and response uh, or start uh, forward, a whole of government response in which the Department is enabling the State Department and USAID personnel to reach further, uh, reach farther into Syria to provide a humanitarian response. Most of the time, the Department has a support role while USAID or State leads the U.S. government's provision of humanitarian stabilization or disaster assistance. In this support role, the Department not only interacts with U.S. government personnel, but also non-federal entities, or NFEs, and non-governmental organizations. From the, the lessons uh, we've learned over the past two decades, it's clear that close interagency coordination is absolutely essential. Civil, uh, civilian expertise, including uh, that from outside organizations, can lead uh, to more sustainable humanitarian assistance, a better picture for the global assistance necessary to set conditions for stability, less costly responses, and a fuller picture of the situation on the ground. Now, there are several challenges to consider as we evaluate the future of the Department's role in foreign assistance. Among the many challenges, state and USAID are not always able to reach as far geographically or provide the number of personnel necessary. 
The Defense Department, too, has limited resources and a broad mission set in a, in a conflict zone beyond humanitarian or stabilization assistance. That is one of the many reasons why it's critical that we continue to fully resource diplomacy and development by funding the State Department's State Department and USAID at sufficient levels. Requests for the Department's resources should be considered only after fully considering the civilian alternatives. In fact, the 2018 National Defense uh, Strategy Summary highlighted the importance of reinforcing diplomacy and development tools to advance U.S. national security objectives. Ideally, our state and USAID colleagues, NFEs and N or NGOs would be capable of responding. Outside of the U.S. government, NGOs operate in every developing country in the world, and the majority of their work includes, conf uh, includes countries that are in conflict. That means the U.S. military, NFEs, and NGOs uh, regularly interact. No matter the, uh, the intent, militaries can, risk, uh, can increase risk for civilians that interact with them, and the department must consider their safety and security. That is one of the reasons why it's important that the department continues to seek state concurrence and, and consult with USAID when working with NGOs and, F and NFEs. Additionally, we've learned that the DOD has unclear guidance when engaging with NFEs. As such, the FY 2018 National Defense Authorization Act requires the department to review and update, if necessary, uh, applicable guidance. Finally, the interagency uh, recently uh, conducted a review of stabilization activities and released the Stabilization Assistance Review uh, Report last month. Hopefully, the report lays out the roles and responsibilities of the State Department, USAID, and the Department of Defense in Stabilization Assistance. That said, the SAR uh, suggests DOD should take a larger role in stabilization activities, which are defined as an, an inherently political endeavor. So I'm interested to learn more, as, uh, as, as service members are often first on the ground, would this lead uh, the, the, to the Department having an increasing role in, uh, in political matters, such as uh, govern governance assistance? Uh, further, uh, with limited resources, should DOD resources be available to other departments uh, and agencies as a non-reimbursable basis, uh, on a non-reimbursable basis, rather than a, a space available basis? So in closing, again, I want to thank our witnesses uh, for their testimony and thank them for, uh, and uh, their colleagues for their efforts to respond to the many humanitarian, stability, and disaster crises around the globe. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back and look forward to our witnesses' testimony. Thank you, Jim. As a reminder to our members, the order of questioning today will be to first call on all ETC members present and then move on to the full committee members. I ask unanimous consent that non-subcommittee members be allowed to participate in today's hearing after all subcommittee members have had the opportunity to ask questions. Is there objection? Without objection, non-subcommittee members will be recognized at the appropriate time for five minutes. Uh, so just to note, we will have two panels. We will have this panel. We'll go around for questions and then invite the second panel. Um, uh, and I will now turn it over to you, Mr. Ladner. Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on how the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and the U.S. Agency for International Development work together to maximize the effectiveness of U.S. foreign. Can you move the microphone a little bit closer? Yes. To maximize the effectiveness of U.S. foreign assistance generally and particularly in conflict-affected environments. State works closely with other parts of the U.S. government as well as many international and non-governmental partners to respond to some of the most challenging complex global crises. Today, I will highlight how state engages with DOD and USAID to help ensure that we maximize our, the effectiveness of our respective resources in the realm of stabilizing conflict-affected areas in order to further our national security interests. Just to put this into perspective, the U.S. government-wide effort to furnish foreign assistance internationally is led by the Secretary of State, who is vested with the broad overarching responsibility and statutory authority for continuous supervision and general direction of U.S. foreign assistance, including security and economic, under the Foreign Assistance Act, the Arms Expert Control Act, and many other statutes providing comparable responsibilities for securing the direction from the Secretary of State. 
For the purpose of furnishing all such U.S. government assistance, there is intense interagency coordination among U.S. government agencies, including USAID, which is a key implementer of U.S. foreign assistance, as well as with DOD, which is a key implementer, which is involved in implementing a wide range of its authorities with concurrence of the Secretary of State. For these purposes, the furnishing of assistance government-wide is subject to open and competitive bidding and procurement procedures. And the U.S. government welcomes involvement of vetted U.S. NGOs and contractors as appropriate and consistent with relevant law and regulation. Through leadership and coordination, state seeks to maximize the impact of foreign assistance by strategically aligning resources to foreign policy goals, measuring what works, and promoting evidence-based policies. We appreciate Congress's continued support in this regard. An integrated whole of government approach is essential to maximize the impact of U.S. foreign assistance resources and advance our foremost foreign policy interests. State works with all the different U.S. government agencies and departments that manage foreign assistance, including DOD, to align our efforts toward common goals and metrics. State's Office of U.S. Foreign Assistance Resources convenes interagency stakeholders and promotes coordinated approaches throughout the formulation, allocation, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation of foreign assistance budget. Our chiefs of mission also play a crucial role in promoting the integration of all bilateral U.S. government assistance at the country level. The chief of mission should, should concur on all bilateral U.S. government assistance provided in their country. State and USAID work with our embassies and missions abroad to maintain integrated country strategies, which provide a framework to guide all interagency efforts. Also, state and DOD in particular work closely at the field level to ensure a coordinated approach to the provision of foreign assistance, associated diplomatic and defense engagement. State's Bureau of Political Military Affairs provides approximately 90 foreign policy uh, advisors to DOD in over 30 locations globally and receives 98 military advisors in return. Other bureaus may also contribute to liaison with combatant commands and other units with whom they regularly coordinate. Using the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations as, as an example, CSO maintains a senior conflict advisor within U.S. Africa Command's J-5 Director for Strategy, Engagements, and Programs, and has previously assigned a counter Boko Haram field representative to coordinate between special operations forces and multiple U.S. missions in Africa's Great Lake, Lake Chad region. Regular exchange, exchanges for training exercise and institutional education, such as U.S. Australia Exercise Talisman Sabre or U.S. Army Special Operations Command Jade Helm, serves to build interorganizational relationships and fam familiarize each organization with each other's priorities and planning processes. A coordinated state USAID DOD approach is particularly important in conflict environments marked by fragility, extremism, and violent conflict. Many of our assistance resources focus on responding to complex crises from Colombia to Nigeria, Somalia, and the Philippines. As this committee knows, global conflict-related challenges have become increasingly complex and intractable. At the same time, the taxpayers are rightly demanding tougher scrutiny on how we spend these resources and avoid open-ended commitments. Cognizant of these challenges, State, USAID, and DOD last year launched the Stabilization Assistance Review, or the SAR. The SAR identified ways that the United States can best leverage diplomatic engagement, defense, and foreign assistance resources to stabilize conflict-affected areas. The final SAR report, approved by the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and USAID Administrator, and released last month, reflects hundreds of expert interviews, case studies, and analysis of spending and conflict data. It outlines a coordinated framework for targeting U.S. efforts to stabilize conflict-affected countries based on our national security interests and an assessment of where we can have the greatest impact. Most importantly, the SAR report affirms that stabilization is an inherently political endeavor. And to better align U.S. government diplomatic, defense, and foreign assistance efforts toward political goals and objectives, the SAR defines lead agency roles for, for stabilization efforts. State as the overall lead for stabilization efforts, as with U.S. foreign assistance more generally, USAID as the lead implementing agency for non-security stabilization assistance, and DOD as a supporting element to include providing requisite security and reinforcing civilian elements where appropriate. In all of these efforts, we work closely with a range of partners. 
The United States is committed to pressing our international partners to increase their share of the cost for responding to shared challenges and to holding our local partners accountable for demonstrating sustained leadership and progress. We also work closely with non-governmental and private sector organizations as we pursue and implement programs on the ground. In line with federal regulations, state, USAID, and DOD identify implementing partners through open and competitive processes. This is important to help ensure that we achieve the most cost-effective result for the American taxpayer. As the Statement of Administration Policy, or the SAP, for the Senate's 2019 NDAA states, the administration recognizes the value of U.S. charitable organizations in its, and situations where closer cooperation with the U.S. military would be more beneficial. However, that SAP also notes objection to relevant provisions as it would provide preferential and unlimited access to DOD personnel funds and assets to implement non-governmental organizations' missions. State with the administration, looks forward to working with Congress to shape these provisions in the NDAA so they are consistent with established best practices for foreign assistance and humanitarian assistance to include appropriate State Department and USAID oversight. A chief consideration- Sir, we're, we're, you're beyond your five minutes, so maybe in the questions you can, um, if you could wrap it up in a final statement, that sure, would be 30 great. more seconds, please. Uh, you can have 15 more seconds, because I really have- uh, a key component when evaluating a prospective partner is that they recognize the authority guidance red line set by the chief of mission and also <laughs> understand the need to be aware of humanitarian actors' unique identity. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Mr. Jenkins, you're recognized for five minutes, and we're going to stick to it. Thank you, Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Longevin, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here before you today with my colleagues from DOD and the State Department on USAID's collaboration with both those agencies on how we work together to advance key national security priorities. In my testimony, I will describe how the executive branch agencies leverage their unique capabilities to respond to crises around the world, and how we are increasingly not just communicating, but actively collaborating with each other and our partners, including non-federal entities, international organizations, contractors, and NGOs. Despite good intentions, experience highlights the need to coordinate, align, and sequence local assistance and security efforts. In response, we have deliberately focused efforts on our interagency communication, coordination, and collaboration, which are now at an all-time high. USAID has more than 30 staff serving side-by-side -side with America's military men and women at the Pentagon, at the combatant commands, and at other military headquarters around the globe. Six months ago, every USAID mission and country office around the world appointed a mission civil military coordinator to advise and work with DOD counterparts on country strategy and implementation. This has further institutionalized our relationship with DOD where it matters most, in the field. The Stabilization Assistance Review that Mr. Ladner referred to has also facilitated that approach. Over the past year, Teams from the Department of Defense, Department of State, and USAID have reviewed the U.S. government's approach towards stabilizing conflict-affected areas overseas. The, star, the SAR establishes a common definition of stabilization and supports a set of actions to improving stabilization efforts. The report also defines lead agency roles, as Mr. Ladner spelled out. On the ground, USAID's long-standing relationship and coordination with DOD during natural disasters is the most visible example of our collaboration. For example, during the Ebola outbreak, USAID requested support from the U.S. military to bring speed and scale to the response and fill specific gaps. These included building Ebola treatment units, training healthcare workers, and running logistics operations to transport critical supplies. At the peak of the operation, nearly 2,500 soldiers deployed to the region as part of the U.S. military mission, along with USAID and State Department. In disasters, DOD is often used as a stopgap measure until civilian infrastructure can be brought to bear. During the 2016 response to Hurricane Matthew, USAID utilized DOD helicopters to deliver critical supplies to the southern claw of Haiti, which was cut off from the rest of the island. USAID positioned two civil military coordinators on the USS Iwo Jima to provide on-site coordination for air operations in support of USAID humanitarian requests. 
Once roads were cleared, civilian partners were able to truck in supplies more consistently and cost effectively. When working with our partners, as well as assisting DOD and State Department and assisting DOD in selecting its own NFEs, we want to use the right tool in the right place at the right time. This limits unintended consequences and working across purposes. As part of this, state and USAID concurrence is necessary before DOD enters into an arrangement with an NFE at the country, GCC, and global levels. It is also consistent with our approach in how we collaborate with DOD on the provision of ODACA funding. We also realize how much time, access, and coordination are of the essence. As demonstrated most recently in Syria and Somalia, the lack of standardized, standardized mechanisms to co-deploy U.S. government civilians and to provide immediate stabilization activities impedes on our ability to, create, to seize critical windows of opportunity. Working, along DOD, working alongside DOD on the ground enables us all to better plan, monitor, and assess local conditions vital to stabilization objectives. Madam Chairwoman, members of the subcommittee, crises cannot be solved by hard power alone. Our close coordination with DOD and the State Department through combined disaster response and cooperation in steady state locations is more important now than ever. Thank you for your time. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, other subcommittee members. It's a pleasure to uh, be here before you again today. And I uh, have the opportunity to talk about uh, DOD's support to uh, foreign assistance. I want to say thanks for your continuing support of the department in our uh, humanitarian assistance missions. I'm pleased to be able to discuss DOD's work with non-federal entities, also known as NFEs overseas, and particularly how NFEs support DOD's humanitarian assistance, humanitarian demining, and support to stabilization in support of USAID and the Department of State. In all of these uh, activities, DOD plays a supporting role, assisting the, the work of the Department of State and USAID. In these scenarios, we encourage our uh, DOD components to work with NFEs when we know that that cooperation will enhance the effectiveness of DOD support and complement the larger efforts uh, of state and USAID. A great example of this cooperation is the instrumental support provided by NFEs to US Southcom uh, and the last two Continuing Promise training missions. Continuing Promise is a US-led medical assistance program integral to building regional partnerships and improving defense cooperation in South and Central America. NFV contributions included 548 medical professionals, 3.2 million of medical services, and over 2.5 million of medicine, supplies, clothing, and high nutrition meals that served over 24,000 citizens in the region. This NFE support is one of DOD's most powerful and indispensable tools. That said, in accordance with the 2018 NDAA, earlier this year, my office conducted a review of DOD's uh, collaboration with NFEs, and we found that the combatant commands did not have a consistent view on what constitutes legal and ethical support uh, and engagement with NFEs. Despite the promising uh, collaborative potential, there have been instances where the commands have been hesitant to receive, transport, or deliver goods from NFEs outside of the contracting and procurement process. We found that the primary reason for this hesitation is due to well-founded uh, concerns about providing or appearing to provide preferential treatment. However, some commands have developed uh, excellent uh, and mature processes like Southern Command for receiving and vetting NFE requests to support DOD humanitarian and other assistance activities. To address this issue, my office has drafted a consolidated guidance to ensure that DOD components have a consistent view on how to work with NFEs in support of their various missions. If and when approved, the draft guidance is not new policy uh, it, but rather consolidates existing policies and provides a framework for future agreements between DOD and NFEs. The exact requirements of these agreements are going to be situationally dependent 
and as a result, our guidance is not overly prescriptive. Uh, first, the guidance defines what constitutes an NFE, a qualified NFE, US-based, have an independent and regularly audited board of directors, are privately funded, are tax exempt under uh, 501c3, provide donated goods and associated services, and do not seek or hold DOD contracts. Second, th the guidance allows DOD to accept donated goods, personnel, and cargo, um, to have actually to have, to have donated goods, personnel, and cargo, like those associated with NFEs, be transported on a space available, non-interference basis. This is permitted in accordance with the Denton program authorized by Title 10, Section 402, and our transportation air eligibility policy. Third, we've, uh, we've extended this authority overseas so commanders can use our, our overseas facilities, and again, on, a, on a, no additional cost to DOD. Finally, our guidance requires that any DOD partnership with an app, applicable NFE be cleared by the relative uh, lead federal agency for the mission, either state or USAID in both, uh, in some circumstances. This is consistent with all DOD support to state and USAID. To summarize, for qualified MFEs, DOD air transportation facilities are available on a non-reimbursable, space-available, and non-interference basis to all qualified NFEs. Uh, on that note, I'd like to return the remainder of my time to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my first question, and it's for the whole panel, uh, you mentioned, Mr. Ladner, in your opening statement, the recently completed Stabilization Assistance Review, the SAR. Um, and I am curious, going forward, what is the process in the coming months for this review to help you? How are you ensuring that some of the recommendations in the review are integrated so that each of your organizations is properly aligning ends, ways, and means to advance our stabiliz stabilization efforts on the ground? And then what are the areas that you think will require the most effort? Is it building the capacity of a civilian expeditionary workforce? Is it ensuring flexible funding? Those are just two examples. Uh, Mr. Ladner, Ladner, I'll start with you. Madam Chairman, thanks for the question. So first and foremost, uh, when the SAR, in the process of, of drafting the SAR and as it was finalized, it was, we worked hand in glove with the NSC and there is a NSC policy coordinating committee that focuses on uh, fragility and stabilization and they have, they have adopted the SAR and are serving to support the implementation as we implement the different recommendations that state, USAID, and DOD have the lead for. So there is an implementation plan and a work plan to make sure that we move out on these, on these recommendations, and that's being followed uh, by the NSC. Secondly, we are looking at um, piloting the SAR in, in a couple key countries over the next 12 months, and it's really where we're gonna learn how this, the rubber hits the road on this issue, and so that will be important. As far as your question on the challenges, what the SAR found was all of our systems, both the executive and legislative branch, incentivized a focus on the money and a focus on getting the outputs, inputs and outputs, and in many ways uh, allowed us to lose some of the focus on the political objectives while we were there. And so part of the process has been socializing. We've talked to a number of committees. We've talked to OMB, to NSC, and it's really understanding that if we all agree that it's the political outcomes we're looking for, then there might be a little less pressure by the systems involved to, to push money out the door um, because that was seen as uh, more is not necessarily more effective uh, I think secondly, and this is a challenging one, uh, but we're working very closely across the three agencies and internally to look at the issue of risk management and how we can understand the trade-offs inherent in both keeping our people safe but also achieving the mission. So I think those two, I think progress in those two over the coming year uh, will be integral. Uh, which countries are we conducting the pilot programs in? Uh, we haven't, that hasn't been uh, finalized yet, but we'd be happy to, to bring that back to you all once, once we do. Yes, that would be important for the subcommittee uh, to know, so we'll follow up on that. Mr. Jenkins? Thank you very much, and thank you for highlighting the SAR, because in my 21 years of experience, I have never seen interagency cooperation work to the degree that it has on the SAR, and we're actually very, very proud of it. Further to the plan, or part of the plan that Mr. Ladner laid out, there's some other key things that are already happening that are vested within the spirit of the SAR. One is Mr. Mitchell's 
uh, team is revising the DOD guidance, in fact, the doctrine on stabilization, that's 3000.05. And the, the guidance as it's currently being written is absolutely consistent with the SAR, so it's becoming doctrine as we speak. We're also working, all three departments, on a global memorandum of understanding or agreement on how we can co-deploy civilians with our military colleagues on a global scale. That will help us get be out in front of the very long, very torturous process that has taken us in the past. We have a great example right now of civil coordination going on in Syria with the Start Forward platform, where a very small team of USAID and State Department uh, personnel are co-deployed with our military colleagues, and it's working perfectly, except it took us a very long time to get there. We have similar experience from Somalia. So as we work on that MOA, that should make us uh, enable us to be much faster and take advantages of windows of opportunity because those windows are often very fleeting. There is also the legislative proposal uh, that DOD and the administration came, for with a, came forward with this year for a authority for stabilization funding for DOD in support of state and aid. It's $25 million, it's very small, it's time limited to two years, and in that proposal, which we all support, very much so, says that DOD can only take, would only be able to undertake stabilization activities with the concurrence of the Secretary of State and in consultation with USAID and OMB. Lastly, Madam Chairman, you, you mentioned two key things. What is it going to take to get a civilian uh, core ready and people trained up so we are ready and have enough people that are able to, willing to deploy fast, that will be a challenge. And what will be the flexible funding needs to make sure we are able to bring all of our unique capabilities to bear together when we need to? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. The, uh, as, as Mr. Jenkins mentioned, the department has currently drafted a new uh, directive on defense support stabilization that's gonna codify within a department our core responsibilities, uh, during stabilization efforts, the key elements of defense support to stabilization, and make sure that we, uh, that we institutionalize the lessons from the SAR and start forward. That directive is currently undergoing a legal sufficiency review, and once that's complete, it will go to the Deputy Secretary of Defense for approval. Um, I also want to mention we are working on the, uh, the, the Global Memorandum of Agreement and voice my support for the legislative proposal and why we in the Department of Defense think that's a critical um, capability for us to have. As we've noted, stabilization is a political um, uh, activity, but there are times when we are on the ground, as, some, as you noted in your opening comments, and state and USAID, the security conditions do not permit them to be there with us. And where there are immediate needs that we recognize that need to take uh, take place to, as we say, prime the pump for stabilization. We do not want to have a long-term responsibility for it. We, we want to continue to work with our state and aid partners, but I think there are limited circumstances where we could use that. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. None of this is your fault, but I don't know a single area of government that's more widely misunderstood back home or more widely criticized. because. Lots of constituents think that somehow the, quote, foreign aid budget is almost half of government spending. And if we could just eliminate it, then we could cut our taxes or balance the budget. Now, as I say, none of this is your fault. But we need to worry about a domestic component of what you're doing so that uh, people can put this in proper perspective. Because my folks, when they think of soft power, they just generally think that's soft. They don't see the power aspect of it. So we live in a time when even the State Department budget itself is a tiny fraction of the DOD budget. Um, USAID has been handicapped for years now. And we are 17, 18 years into nation building. And this is a subject that's also widely ridiculed. One of the most prominent novels from Afghanistan war was Phil Clay's redeployment. And he highlights a program there that was beekeeping for Afghan widows. 
and that apparently allowed U.S. bureaucrats to check all the boxes for projects. It was partly agricultural, partly war widows, partly female, partly, you know, all this stuff. So how do we do a better job of helping people understand the needs out there, the effectiveness of U.S. soft power? And, you know, a lot of folks, if I tell them back home, we've got a SAR going now, and they say, oh, yeah, 18 years after we started getting involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, and it's a whole of government approach, they're really going to be impressed by that because they thought government was supposed to coordinate already. So, again, none of this is your fault, but we've got to fix this problem. What would you suggest? Thank you, Congressman Cooper. You're right. It's always a challenge selling to the American people the importance of what foreign assistance does. We all understand, as you noted, that there are a lot of hard lessons to be pulled from the last 15 to 17 years, and that's exactly what the SAR does. In a nutshell, it tells us that it's small actually is beautiful, that even though we are the strongest nation in the history of the globe, we can't solve problems just by throwing money and throwing people at those problems. We have to be smart, we have to use analysis, we have to listen to the people on the ground who have the best ideas always, and by that I mean the people that live there, and we need to have political will on the partners that we're working with. We often say we can't want it more than they do, and yet we move ahead when we don't, when they don't. The SAR and our collective action says moving forward, we're gonna put some, guide, some guideposts in there. We're gonna say every year, is this working or is it not? There's great examples of where it has. Plan Columbia, the last 10 years of the work that have got, has gone on in the Fatah in Pakistan, I haven't heard Waziristan in the news for a very long time now. It used to be one of the most dangerous places on earth. And sadly, it might become that again. But using, using our soft power, when it works along with their hard power, is exactly what the American people need for their safety. It's hard to sell that. But I know every, I don't know a single American that isn't inspired when they see one of those C-17s landing in a foreign land and the back of the plane opens up and those pallets of USAID branded supplies and food come out. Or in Nepal in the earthquakes, watching those marine helicopters deliver vital life-saving supplies in the farthest, farthest reaches of the mountains of Nepal. This is important stuff. This is critical stuff and we all have to work together to let the American people know this is not charity, this is national security. And it's also the right thing to do. Thank you. Sir, thank you for your question. Uh, a first point, it's known the, the constraints that the State Department has on telling its story uh, to the American people, but I would laud and would be happy to share some of the work that our Office of Foreign Assistance is doing, uh, and they've created an interactive website where each state, uh, individuals in each state can go and look at what the State Department is doing to promote the interests of that state of this country. So we're happy to share that, and, and, and that's a, a baby step in that direction. Uh, your point uh, about checking the boxes uh, is exactly what the SAR is trying to, to push against, and the call for a strategy that's politically focused, targeted, that is key on, as Mr. Jenkins said, us understanding when we want it more than our counterpart and finding ways to make that, to avoid that situation or walk away. Uh, two things that I would Time's highlight. expired. Mr. Scott, we can thank take the rest of it for the record. Mr. Scott, go ahead. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick point. I'd like to point out that we didn't receive some of the testimony until this morning. Uh, that seems to be a continued problem with multiple agencies and, and not getting um, us testimony in a timely manner so that it can be reviewed prior to the, the hearings. Uh, I want to men mention a couple of things. Uh, I, I think this is an extremely important part of who we are uh, as Americans. And uh, I think that, um, I think it is charity as well as, as national security, Mr. Jenkins. And I think that being charitable is part of who, who we are uh, as, a, as a country. I appreciate your comments on that. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with us calling it uh, charity as well, as well as national security. Um, and I agree with you when the, when the, when the back end of a Osprey or a C-17 opens up and their, and their pallets, whether it be of water or of 
food or of medical supplies, whatever that humanitarian assistance is, um, I take pride in the fact that uh, Americans are, are providing that. And I will tell you, if, if we asked for, the, for Americans to contribute uh, in addition to their tax dollars to it, I think that we would be taken back at how much uh, the American citizens uh, would give. I, I have one request, and this comes, uh, I have a facility, uh, manna is actually produced in Fitzgerald, Georgia. Uh, it's a ready-to-eat paste. Uh, when I look at the packaging that we, that we have, um, just one suggestion, I think that the American flag or, or the USAID symbol should be more prominently displayed uh, on the packaging as we move forward. I think that uh, we want people to know uh, where it comes from, and I think that the American flag still stands uh, for freedom th right. throughout the world. And so just a suggestion for USAID that, that the American flag and the USAID symbol should be uh, more prominently displayed when we, when we provide that. I'll mention a couple of things very quick before I get into the one question that I have. Uh, when I was in Djibouti, uh, Earlier this year, I noticed that the Chinese had uh, a hospital ship where they're now providing uh, humanitarian assistance in, in countries. I was a little taken back by that because that was a uh, stark change in their approach to influence in, in countries. It has typically been um, almost bribery or payday loan style, uh, but I noticed the hospital ship, and it's one of the things I remember from that trip. And yet, the United States Department of Defense has proposed to stand down um, one of our hospital ships. We stopped that through the National Defense Authorization Act without providing, prior to that proposal, a plan to replace that mission. Now, I understand that DOD has come forward with a plan to replace that mission, but I, I know we're not here to talk about. DOD and hospital ships, but that is part of our humanitarian mission, and I do think uh, it is important that we understand that China is, is exerting their influence through humanitarian efforts now uh, as well. My primary question gets back to um, Mr. Jenkins. You talked about kind of the timeline, if, if you will, and we have these, these moments when we need to move very, very fast to get aid, uh, the right aid to the right place at the right time. And uh, more often times than not, uh, that gap is, is, is of a very short uh, duration. So my question gets to the interagency approval process. Um, the role of state, um, by which foreign assistance such as disaster relief, humanitarian aid, and stabilization support, how, how, what is the approval process? And the approval process for something that happens like a, a um, storm or a tsunami uh, versus something that happens in um, an area that may be a result of a combat zone or uh, some other type of civil unrest. Thank you for your question and thank you for your comments regarding USAID and, you know, and branding from the American people. In the last two days I've been in meetings with both my acting deputy administrator and administrator Mark Green precisely on that topic about what more we can do to make sure that more of our beneficiaries get the message that this is coming from as part of the generosity of the American people and the American taxpayer. Regarding a rapid onset disaster, part of our uh, agency is geared exactly to that. Our Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance has teams that monitor every volcano, every earthquake, every possible tsunami in the world 24-7 every day. If there is a rapid onset disaster, the ambassador at the U.S. Embassy in that uh, country sends what is a, uh, a cable back to Washington, but if it doesn't, it doesn't have to wait for that cable, they declare a disaster, OFTA takes that cable, immediately goes into action mode, assembles, if need be, what's called a response management team here in Washington, and deploys a DART, a disaster assistance response team. Sometimes, as we saw last year with the Mexico, uh, Mexico City earthquake, that included search and uh, rescue uh, teams from, uh, from Los Angeles County that were flown on C-17s provided by mil the military. We respond to about 65 different disasters every year in about 50 different countries, more than a disaster a week. 
in about five to 10% of those, it's beyond our ability to respond as fast as we need to, so we turn to the US military to bring us speed and scale. Usually that's logistics and transport uh, on, on heavy air transport. The time's okay. expired. Mr. Vizi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering, uh, you know, what sort of um, efforts were put in place to plan for the future, and, and specifically what I mean is stabilization in the future. You take a place like Syria, where we obviously have a stake uh, in Syria right now. So if the Assad regime were to fail uh, and, 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 and be overthrown by factions that we're helping there, uh, what, what do our agencies, what are they doing now to make sure that these are people that we can work with in the future as far as governance is concerned. Of course, we've had some issues with people that we've helped in the past, and I'm just curious like, what sort of preliminary plans are being put in place to help aid in some, something like that? Th thank you for your question. And, and globally, whether it be the case you mentioned or, or others, uh, parts of our agencies work together to do scenario planning, contingency planning, and to make sure that they speak to some of the key policy questions so that you know what you may have to deal with at the time. So um, it would be case specific. Some of them are more robust than others. We know that our DOD colleagues uh, have more plans on the shelf than the civilian side, but I think that's been, that's something that the SAR is calling for is much more of an increase in, in the civ mill planning together using these principles and thinking about contingencies and what could happen uh, it is something that it doesn't come by nature uh, to some, some parts of the bureaucracy, but we're working on that. Do you think the factions that, we've, that we support in Syria right now, do you think that they are uh, you know, manageable or, or, or can govern uh, if there were a regime change in that country? There are others back at the department that are, would give you a better answer than that, so we will take that back and, and, and get you an answer on that. What about uh, as far as in terms of... Um, anyone that we help, them being a, someone that can get along with their neighbors. Obviously, uh, you know, with Iraq, for instance, you know, we've seen that now there is an allegiance with, uh, within, with, some, with some factions there with the people next door uh, in Iran. And my question is, as far as, them, as, far as uh, people being able to, someone that, that we help, what sort of things do we put in place to make sure in places like Syria, or it can even be someplace in Africa, that after we do help stabilize, if they won't try to destabilize their neighbors because of some uh, religious differences or some other long-term differences that may be in place? I think the best answer is that we p try to understand internally across the U.S. government what our red lines are and how certain policy priorities rack and stack against each other, that for any country you may allude to, we have counterterrorism priorities, conflict and stabilization priorities, uh, trade priorities, and so those all have to be understood in a broader picture. And so I think the issue is being very clear about what our priorities are, what our red lines are, and then being prepared through some, some thoughtful forethought with contingency planning. Um, but it, it, there is no panacea, but I think it's just us being honest with ourselves about what our priorities are in a place and then executing as a, as a whole of government. Are those sort of things looked at before regime uh, change takes place? Are there, are, there, are there plans, people looking at those things like, you know, a year, uh, you know, two years in advance, depending on uh, what the military may come back with uh, uh, as far as their assessment on when a regime change may take place? I'll just add, sir, that um, we have USAID and State Department personnel at the Geographic Combatant Commands that are engaged with the planning efforts the DOD has mm -hmm. every single day. So as much as DOD plans, and they're good at planning, we make sure that civilians have input into all of those plans. And if need be, our folks come back to Washington and tell us, hey, we need some help. I was down in Tampa just a few weeks ago um, I go to Tampa, others go to PACOM, much more than I would have thought as a USAID person. But rest assured, while it's this crazy world and we don't know what's coming down the pike, the planning efforts that your government, our government undertake are being done as a whole of government right now. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, are you back? 
Mr. Mitchell, did you want to answer that question? I just wanted to add that, it, of course, the department is, is very uh, attuned to places where there may be uh, a regime change like that. But even when we have um, democratic elections with some of our allies and partners, we encounter some of the same challenges. And so it's something that we work very closely with uh, across our, our partnership with state, AID, and the, the White House and the NSC. Mr. Heiss. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Stabilization Assistance Review had one sentence that particularly caught my eye. It said the stabilization assistance is not an entitlement and continued U.S. government assistance should depend on results. A great statement. So Mr. Ladner and Mr. Jenkins, I'll direct this to both of you. I'd like to hear from both of you on this. What are we doing to better design and sequence uh, our aid in such a way that tax dollars are being used most effectively? Thank you for your, thank you for your question. And I think uh, we must, the SAR, looking back over the last few decades, understood that in the past, we focused on perhaps not the exact right uh, indicators. We were more focused on inputs and outputs and counting things. And I think where we are now and what the SAR asks for is to really pull from social science, from anthropology, from all the fields that truly understand what's the political game in a place and is it moving in the right direction to support our national interests. That is what the SAR is saying must be in place and must have a seat at the policy table. So I think. Uh, to be humble on it, I think, I think we're still trying to learn how that works and how you feed that into a policymaking process that has all the demands and urgency placed on it. But that is exactly, uh, there's a specific deliverable in the SAR to work on better measurements of our impact. And thank you for your question. If you look at where assistance and stabilization assistance has been successful, there are three key components always. You need security first. It doesn't make any sense to build a school if people are afraid to send their kids to that school. So don't waste the time and don't waste the effort and don't waste taxpayer money building a school until there's adequate security. Two, you need a willing partner that has political will to be a partner and we need to find partners in these places that want what we want. And we can't want it more than them. And that's one of the things you need to assess over time. It's laid out in the SAR. If we start an endeavor, we need to keep checking in to see if that endeavor is making sense and if we have the right partner. And then three, you need time. You can't change the strategy every year. You have to be tenacious. You have to know there's gonna be some good days and bad days. You need to have the strategic patience to see the plan through and stay the course long enough, but checking in constantly to see if that's still the same course. Well, I get that, but it really doesn't answer my question, all, all due respect. The uh, question is, what are we doing to make sure that we are getting the results that the taxpayers deserve? I mean, I understand what ought to be out there, but what are we doing to ensure that happens? Thank you. So what we're doing now is we are taking this SAR, we've taken the lessons learned, we've taken the recent CIGAR report on stabilization in Afghanistan, and now we're moving ahead to implement those lessons. The things of now that we've been saying in the SAR are being validated by other reports. Do we have enough time under the bridge to determine whether or not we are getting the desired results? We are in some places, and we are not getting the desired results in other places, and we have to be very wide open about and eyes open on what do we be, need to do better. So what we've now assembled is a way forward that's going to do that based on data, based on analysis. I'd like to see some of the data that already exists in some of those nations, if you could provide that for us. I would appreciate that. happy to provide that. that. What are we doing to uh, ensure that host nations are following through with their commitments, specifically uh, in terms of uh, places where corruption exists and some of these other things? So one of the things we have started at USAID under this administration, and our administrator Mark Green has brought in, is we've d we're developing a system, a, uh, a set of metrics where we'll be doing exactly that. Those are still underdeveloped, uh, under development, but looking at every country is on its own path to self-reliance. We need to gauge what our role is in helping them or not helping them based on some of the factors exactly that you're saying right now. 
it doesn't make any sense to be doing democracy programs with a government that doesn't want to become democratic, and it doesn't make any sense to continue to do anti-corruption programs with in ministries or governments that don't care because they want to be corrupt. And that was your, really your second point that you brought up of the three, uh, where those governments have to want it. Uh, are, uh, do the assistance that we provide come with any good government mandates? It, as Mr. Or Ladner, should it? As Mr. Ladner said, it's different in different places depending on what our primary national security goals are there. <laughs> Time's expired. Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and for having this hearing. Um, Mr. Jenkins, I have a question for you first. Uh, we often see the UN's bureaucracy as being slow and ineffective. So this, this led the United States, as uh, Vice President Pence was working on last October uh, in an article I have, to bypass the UN and provide aid directly to the uh, Yazidis, the Christians, and other persecuted minorities in northern Iraq, directly through USAID and USG partnerships with faith-based organizations that were in the area, as opposed to working through the UN. How has that worked? And should we consider doing that more often in the future? Thank you very much. Just before the July 4th holiday, my administrator, Mark Green, uh, conducted a trip to the Nineveh Plains to personally look at the situation that you're talking about. We are now in the process of, based on his uh, observations, developing a plan to maximize uh, everything we can do to help the religious and ethnic minorities in the Nineveh Plains. Part of what we've seen, though, is it makes sense sometimes to work with the United Nations where what they're doing and what we want to be done are in alignment. They are one of the many tools we have, and we wouldn't want to say we're not going to work with the UN. In fact, we need the UN when you look at what the World Food Program does every day to save starving children. But what we need to do, and this is what we like to do everywhere, when we say we need the right partner in the right place at the right time, is have a suite of different capabilities to go to. Sometimes it will be the United Nations, sometimes it will be a large international NGO, sometimes it will be a local faith-based organization, sometimes it will be a contract. So is it working in the Nineveh Plains? I believe it's not working to the degree that we need it to be working, and that's why we are doubling down our efforts right now and coming up with plans that will be announced in the next coming weeks of what more we're going to do. Okay, and if you could keep us apprised of that, we would appreciate that. Happily, sir. And then secondly, for all, uh, all of you on the panel, uh, the use of emerging technologies, and if you already discussed this, uh, pardon me because I was in a markup in another committee earlier and I was late getting here, but um, has the U.S. government been able to identify newer emerging technologies that can better use metrics and um, document the progress or lack of progress of humanitarian assistance and outreach in high conflict zones? Thank you for your question. That's actually one of the more exciting parts of the work that is, is being done in this field is looking at whether it be whether it be satellite imagery, whether it be the ability to, to crunch large numbers of data, crowdsourcing of public opinion, all of that information is being brought in and being looked through by PhD social scientists to say what, what early warning, how do we get ahead of the curve on this, how do we understand all the different trends, and how to understand who the key actors are. So uh, we'd be happy to, to come back on and give a, a conversation about that particular topic because we do think that it's, it's made advances. The challenge is how do you feed that into a policy-making process? And I think that that's where the rubber hits the road, because the best information that doesn't make it through into the key conversation is not useful. So I think that's where the, the, the next step needs to go. And specifically on humanitarian assistance, uh, my agency, and particularly my bureau, has a standing relationship with MIT Lincoln Labs, where we literally can call them on the phone and say, we have a problem that we want you to look at, and they immediately get to, they have a team about 45 people specifically on humanitarian assistance. That's changing the packaging of our food products, that's helping us monitor and evaluate, trying to find how do we track that food to the final point somewhere in, in rural Somalia. It's where do we position the, the warning uh, uh, sirens around Mosul Dam, should that dam break? And it, it, we're using it every day, trying to use 
all the best technology we can and the brightest minds to help solve what some of these uh, really, really sticky but critical problems. At the, uh, as we rolled out the stabilization assistance review uh, several months ago, State Department hosted a group of business executives and non-governmental organizations, international organizations, to brief them on that. I had the pleasure of sitting at a table with uh, several uh, tech executives who were developing exactly the kind of stuff that you're talking about uh, to utilize social media and the infor information technology infrastructure to gather information. And that, that stabilization assistance review and the implementation of that is also providing us additional access to them. Okay, thank you all. Time's expired. Thank you very much to our first panel of witnesses. Uh, I know there are a few follow-ups, uh, and we'd like answers for the record. Uh, thank you for um, your thoughtful answers on this critical discussion. I now want to transition to the second panel of witnesses. Um, and I'll wait till you guys switch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the second panel where we will hear the NGO perspective. Um, we have Mr. Julian Schopp, Director of Humanitarian Practice at InterAction, which is an alliance of NGOs and international partners. And we have Ms. Melissa Dalton, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the International Security Program at CSIS, as well as the Director of the Cooperative Defense Project. We look forward to both of your testimonies. And Mr. Schopp, I'll start with you. Five minutes. Madam Chair Stefanik, uh, Ranking Member Langevin, members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify on this important topic. So as you mentioned, I work for InterAction, which is the largest alliance of international NGOs in the US. And our members regularly operate uh, in areas where the US military is active, um, either in sudden onset disasters or in uh, armed conflict. So today I'd like to provide a better understanding of the NGO perspective uh, on humanitarian assistance and when, how, and why our members decide to coordinate or sometimes not coordinate uh, their activities with the US military. So what we call civil coordination. Um, so first of all, a, a, little, a few points on humanitarian action as, as, as we define it. Uh, humanitarian action is assistance for and protection of people affected by natural hazards or armed conflicts. And NGO mandates uh, are guided, guided by the humanitarian imperative to save lives and reduce human suffering wherever it happens. Um, and in order for this uh, to be as effective as possible from, from, from our perspective, we rely on four principles. The first one is humanity, so human suffering must be addressed wherever it is found. The second one is impartiality, and by that we mean uh, that we need to carry humanitarian assistance based on need alone, without any other considerations, be it nationality, race, gender, religious beliefs, political opinions, or whatnot. The third principle uh, with uh, which we work is neutrality. Humanitarian actors must not take sides in hostilities or engage in controversies of a political nature uh, or religious or, ide or ideological. And finally, independence. Uh, humanitarian action must be autonomous from the political, economic, military, or other objectives that any other actor may hold in the area where we operate. So these are the, the, the recognized four humanitarian principles that guide humanitarian organizations in their work. And they're really a tool to convince the people that we assist uh, that we are not part of a broader uh, effort, be it military or political. And this is more and more important today because as much as we've talked uh, until now about uh, natural disasters, in reality, NGOs today, 80% uh, of their work is in conflict zones or uh, working with people that have been displaced as a result of conflict, and only 20% in natural disasters. And 20 years ago, this, this uh, proportion uh, was opposite. So I think that changes the nature of our work, and this is why this is very important. 
As it relates specifically to civil coordination, uh, this is an essential dialogue for us between the military and, and, and the civil uh, civilians present in the same theater of operations in humanitarian emergencies. Um, there's a large spectrum of, uh, uh, of means to engage with the military, but we'll just focus on two. Um, the first one is cooperation, um, and that's really more, uh, happens more in natural disasters as was discussed previously. Um, and this is where there's a common goal of all parties. Um, and as has been mentioned previously, a good example of this has been the Ebola response, where the military assets were bring to bear. There was civilian leadership from uh, our colleagues from USAID, and on the ground, it was NGOs that were actually implementing the programs to, uh, to, to stem the epidemic and, and, and to deal with, uh, with community mobilization and the health response. Um, the other type of... Uh, relationship that we have with the military is what we call coexistence. Um, and that's more often seen in a uh, situation where the US military is either a direct party to the conflict or perceived to be a direct party to the conflict. And that's the case in some of the settings that we've discussed, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, or Yemen. So in this instances, uh, NGOs tend to try to maintain a clear distinction uh, between themselves and, and military actors, again, to not be perceived to be part of, of, of the military effort. Um, and, and from our interactions with, with, with military colleagues, um, they, they often tell us that they also see that the, the use of military capabilities to deliver humanitarian assistance for them takes focus away from their core uh, military uh, objectives and, you know, from a, um, from a taxpayer perspective, is more expensive than any civilian uh, alternative. So the use of military assets is actually one of the least used means to deliver humanitarian assistance. Um, in conflicts, the... the Time's expired. Okay. Sorry about that. Ms. Dalton, you're recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair Stefanik, Ranking Member Langevin, and distinguished members, it is an honor to testify before you today on the Department of Defense's role in foreign assistance. I will focus for my remarks on four areas, framing DOD's role, challenges, opportunities, and a summary of the recommendations I offer in my written testimony. DOD plays an important supporting role in U.S. Humanitarian and Disaster Relief, or HADR, and stabilization missions as global crises arise. DOD's ability to mobilize resources quickly, secure access, and jumpstart critical HADR and stabilization operations is a key function of the U.S. Foreign Policy Toolkit. In addition, to keep pace with strategic competitors, China and Russia, reinforcing a network of partners at the state, sub-state, and trans-regional levels through HADR and stabilization missions will both bolster U.S. efforts to counter coercion and retain access and influence. To this end, the 2018 National Defense Strategy highlights the imperative for DOD to enable U.S. interagency counterparts to advance U.S. influence and interests. DOD supports state USA and USAID in HADR and stabilization activities. Next, I'll turn to the challenges. <coughs> Excuse me. Every HADR and stabilization response provides an opportunity to garner best practices and lessons learned. The U.S. government inevitably is challenged in at least three respects in any HADR and stabilization mission. First, given that DOD is often the first U.S. entity on the ground, there may be a tendency to frame the policy and the mission from a national security perspective and crowd out other important foreign policy considerations, such as how to fit these activities into a broader strategy and what second and third order effects the intervention may have. This may lead to a preference for primarily leveraging military capabilities for a civilian-led and focused mission operation and mission creep beyond the original policy and mandate for U.S. forces. Second, growing political and public skepticism of the return on investment for U.S. foreign assistance may constrain future policy and legislative latitude in conducting HADR and stabilization missions. Finally, cuts to the state and USAID budgets will impair their ability to be responsive to foreign assistance requirements around the globe. DOD, in turn, may have to work doubly hard not to overreach if the departments it is supporting do not have the manpower or resourcing to perform their leading functions. On the flip side, there are several opportunities to harness. 
DOD benefits from a rigorous internal lessons learned process that may allow it to examine mission history, adapt, and be responsive to future HADR and stabilization requirements. In addition, DOD operators have forged robust relationships with USAID and state personnel over the last 15 years through shared experiences such that there are at least two generations of DOD personnel that have a deep sense of the importance of interagency relationships and coordination. This is reflected in the Interagency Stabilization Assistance Review, or SAR, framework, which offers a common definition and set of principles for stabilization for the first time. More broadly, DOD accrues benefits from conducting HADR and stabilization missions in several respects, deepening relationships with partners in building their capacity, facilitating combatant command access, knowledge of the laws, institutions, systems, and capacities of partners, which can inform planning, and increasing readiness of U.S. forces for a range of contingencies. With their close access to and communication with affected civilians, humanitarian organizations are uniquely placed to provide critical information to military counterparts about the impacts of HADR and stability operations on civilian populations while still abiding by their principle of neutrality. DOD should seek to expand and deepen these relationships, working in tandem with USAID and state. Finally, I'll summarize the recommendations I provided in my written testimony. The U.S. government with DOD in a supporting role should develop tailored playbook books for a range of contingencies with U.S. interagency nodes and mechanisms identified that can be pulled into teams and employed quickly. It should conduct scenario-based tabletop and operational exercises with a mix of national security policy, operators, and non-federal entities to inform planning for future operations should decide on clear objectives and outcomes, set realistic goals with local buy-in, and prioritize layer and sequence lines of effort among interagency and multinational partners. It should increase assessment, monitoring, and evaluation systems and accountability measures to understand the local context before launching the mission and ensure HADR and stabilization objectives and outcomes are met. It should pick and employ the right people with regional and functional expertise and improve the authorities and mechanisms for operating in complex environments and at the sub-state and trans-regional levels, especially for contexts in which reliable state-based governments may not exist or be able to be engaged. It should own the narrative, speak effectively and consistently about U.S. intentions and activities, and it should engage with humanitarian implementers regularly to inform understanding of the local context, partners, and impact on local civilians while respecting their principle of neutrality. Okay, your time is up here. Thank you. We're gonna start time for my questions. If you both can use that time uh, and um, do the end statements, you can use some of my question time. So why don't you finish up quickly, and then you can go Mr. Shop. Thank you so much. I was just gonna thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I had reached the end, thank you. Great, and Mr. Shop, you had some additional remarks. My one question for you is, you talked about how uh, NGOs make the decision to work with DOD and not work with DOD. Can you walk us through that decision-making process, why you would choose to work with DOD and then why not? And then if you had additional statements, you can use this time for that as well. Thank you for your question. I represent 190 members, so 190 different non-governmental organizations, so I, 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 70 of which work in humanitarian uh, settings. I think each organization's got its own way of looking at these, the, these relationships and has, has a different means of analysis. So you have a full spectrum of some organizations that will be more willing to cooperate and others less. Um, and, and that's really based on their mandate, their history, uh, and, and how they, they view the, the response as a whole. Um, I think one thing to, to, to note is, is that what you do in one theater of operation nowadays, uh, we heard about uh, social media, et cetera, is now known in other, in other theaters of operation. So what you do in one country, maybe for, for pragmatic reasons, may influence and, and, and other operations that you're working in. Um, I, I won't necessarily take more of the time uh, just thanking you, and, and I think it's a very uh, important dialogue that we have with you, and really thanking you for uh, having us here. Um, my other question, Ms. Dalton, I understand that you worked with interagency on the SAR, and uh, I want you to, if you could, grade the homework of the interagency in putting that together. What do you think has been left out? What do you think will be most difficult to implement moving forward? 
Thank you uh, for, for the question. Um, first, I actually want to commend um, the interagency for putting forward the SAR. Um, some may critique the fact that we've been attempting these types of operations for a good 15 to 20 years. Why, why only now? I think it's a unique moment of, in, in the American context in terms of uh, both political and budgetary pressures that are, are compelling this narrative, but also, frankly, um, some uh, complementary streams uh, and, and lines of argument in terms of what does our, our what do our investments abroad really get us? Um, but I think the the framework actually did a really nice job first of articulating a common definition across the U.S. government in terms of what do we mean by stabilization as as a political activity, and setting out the specific sets of supporting activities that each uh, agency needs to undertake in support of that, um, and also lying out uh, specific guidelines informed by a ro robust literature review and, and consultations with, with the policy and practitioner communities. Going forward, I think there are some key questions, uh, the devil's in the details, in terms of, of operationalizing this. I, I think that um, setting out uh, some key criteria in terms of where stabilization can actually take hold, doing the robust uh, upfront assessment of, of what sort of impacts and outcomes we can actually achieve, having the, the apparatus within the U.S. government to, to perform those functions upfront w when matched with the political urgency um, that often comes with, with having to launch stability operations. These are often crisis-driven events, so taking a deep breath and suppressing that urge to, to fire um, and, and forget, I think, will be a bit of a cultural change um, across the, the U.S. government. Um, but I think the, there's a good starting point here, um, and, and collectively, I think Congress, pol broader policy community, NGO community um, can, can help um, the interagency in articulating some next steps. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Mr. Schott mentioned in his testimony he has 190 members. Or how many NGOs don't belong to your organization? I'm afraid I do not know this. I mean, the, the, what, to be a member of Interaction, you have to have a legal uh, existence and, 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 and status in the U.S. I would, I would say 90% of the NGOs working internationally are members of Interaction, but that's, uh, that's an approximation. 90% of the U.S. NGOs? Working internationally, yes. Okay. What market share do you have of international NGOs based in other countries? Uh, I, I think it's difficult to say because n many of the, m of the bigger actors that, that you, you hear about, the Save the Children's, the World Visions, are now federations. So they, they, have a US, they have a U.S. office, they have a U.K. office, they'll have a Swiss office, they'll have a, a, an African office in Nairobi in Kenya, they'll have a regional office in Bangkok. It's very difficult to, to say. So, for example, would Doctors Without Borders be a member of your organization? No, it's one of the rare ones that are not. Uh, and interestingly enough, they used to be, uh, and they left interaction uh, during their Iraq invasion because they wanted to keep, okay. as because of what we said, uh, completely neutral uh, in their approach, and they felt that interaction at the time did not. In your testimony, you say 80% of these are now involved in conflict areas, and that's the reverse percentage. Natural disasters haven't gone down. So um, is this more money going into conflict areas or just a shift of old money? I think there's two, there's two elements to that. The first element is I do think that we have success with uh, nations that are prone to, to, climate, uh, to climate hazards in terms of disaster risk reduction and preparing them better to, to answer and respond themselves. So I think there is less of a need for international support uh, for natural disasters. It's only the really large scale natural disasters now that require the support of the international community. While before I think it, they were much more uh, numerous. Uh, and in terms of the conflict, I think that uh, from what we see, all the conflicts that we are involved in have been protracted. They've been going on for a long time. So it's not you replace one with the other, they just add uh, one to another. And that's one of the issues that we have is looking towards political solutions to solve those conflicts and not let them uh, become so protracted. 
I don't want to be cynical, but it almost seems like if an NGO is involved in a conflict situation, that means the NGO got involved too late, because it's always better to prevent a conflict than to try to ameliorate an existing one. Uh, fair enough. If you're if if you're present on on the ground and you're and you and you're part of this uh, uh, of this, but I, I mean, I would argue, you know, from a humanitarian organization perspective, this is our job to come in at those times uh, when there is no one else to come to the assistance of the civilians that have been displaced or are, are targeted. There's there's no government structure. There's no there's no other form of support. So it is. We only come when it's uh, when it's too late. I agree. I would not necessarily blame us for that. So, with your members, we could estimate, especially since most are U.S. based, the total uh, contributions or revenues of those organizations, and therefore we could check and see how much the U.S. tax expenditure is for those organizations, because most people who donate want a tax break. I mean, we, we could follow up with you and, 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 and look a little bit into, into those figures. I think one important point maybe to, to, your, uh, to your question is NGOs have very different uh, sources of funding these days. Some is federal, some is from foreign governments, some is from corporations, mm -hmm. and a lot from private citizens. And so we have to look at the proportions of this, and they're unique for each organization. So the nature of your organization prevents you from grading them, which are more effective. Right? You don't, all your children are equally beautiful. Uh, of course. Um, no, but we do, what, what we do is to be a member of Interaction, you have to commit to a certain number of standards that are internationally recognized standards. Uh, and so there is a threshold to become an Interaction member and, and, and to be recognized as such. And it's recognized by the US government as somewhat of a, a stamp of approval. My time's about gone, but some countries like Russia are treating NGOs as, in fact, government organizations. Egypt, other countries are doing that too. So increasingly, it's a suspect category. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see uh, three seconds left. I don't want to incur the wrath of the chair. Go ahead. We only have a few more members. Uh, I mean, just to, just to answer that, I think this is why it's more and more important, uh, or as important as ever, to really abide by these humanitarian principles, because we do have to convince all parties to the conflicts and all governments that our aims are not political and that we are not, uh, you know, part of another agenda. So to, to answer your question, and it is difficult and more and more difficult. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Dalton. Uh, in your testimony, one of your recommendations is the d development of uh, off-the-shelf playbooks for a range of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief contingencies. Can you provide us with more in-depth discussion on interagency nodes and also in large disaster relief? It's, it's, it's inter-country as well. Um, and the capabilities and what it would take what would have to be prepared to be pulled into an employment team? And could we get agreement among uh, multiple countries uh, of, of what those plays would be? Thank you for the question. Um, it, as I had framed the recommendation, I was thinking more in terms of a US interagency look at creating playbooks. But I think you raised an important uh, second element of that, which is how to leverage allies and partners that would inevitably uh, be called upon to, to be a part of, of the response team. Um, so I think it starts with first doing that internal assessment um, that I, I think DOD is well situated to do unto itself in terms of aligning um, particular nodes of the DOD organization that would be called upon to address a particular scenario and then what capabilities would need to be leveraged to then take the step of looking across the interagency. Um, of course, state and USAID being the, the prime partners, um, but might there be other entities, um, Treasury, Justice, depending on uh, the, the nature of the beast that would need to be pulled into that as well, and, and designing essentially a, a playbook from day zero to day N in terms of when you would need to pull in uh, different elements, different capabilities to address a particular scenario. And then the third level of analysis is, as you suggest, um, which I think is a great addition, is having a conversation depending on the scenario with the relevant regional partners or more broadly extra-regional allies 
that might not be uh, needed to be drawn into uh, the, the equation and perhaps incorporating that into regular annual bilateral dialogues that we have with many of our allies and partners um, might be a, a good forum in which to have that conversation. It, uh, it, it seems to me that one of the key questions here is who's in charge, because it, someone, someone has to make the decision, someone has to lead, and someone has to follow, e even in a partnership. And um, I just, um, I think that's an important part of, of what we do as America and, and who we are. And uh, I, I think that, um, I think there's a lot of good work that unfortunately, anytime there's a little mistake, there's a tremendous amount of criticism and the majority of the good work goes, goes without notice. So thank you for what all of you do. I think it's an important part of who we are as Americans. And uh, with that, I would yield my time. Thank you. We're going to do a second round of questions for those that are interested. Um, I wanted to follow up. In my opening statement, I talked about how this subcommittee in particular has been very focused on uh, the 18 years of CT operations and near constant combat. Um, for viewers, so for constituents that we each represent who have very busy lives, um, I know we're very focused on the SAR review, but let's take it up to sort of the 30,000 foot level. Looking back at the past 18 years, what are the biggest, the three biggest problems in our stabilization efforts that we need to fix moving forward? Go ahead. <laughs> um, sure, happy to, to take the first crack at that. Um, you know, I think it's the, the meta conversation to be had around um, counterterrorism of the last 18 years is that counterterrorism unto itself is not a strategy. Um, and that we've been attempting to approach it as such. Um, and when we think about stabilization, it's that thing that happens after CT, and yet we find ourselves kind of in this do loop over and over again of thinking that we've addressed the terrorism's challenge and then flip the switch for stabilization. I think what we found over time um, is that the, these situations are a lot more fluid, um, that you have to start laying the groundwork as you go um, in the course of conducting a counterterrorism operation to be cognizant of the context in which you're operating, how it nests into a broader country or even regional strategy, um, and then how you start laying the foundations for stabilization um, as you are conducting your kinetic operations, that perhaps there is a greater need to have um, more dialogue with humanitarian implementers while conducting your kinetic operations to understand what is the impact on the civilian population. How can we start layering in the initial ingredients of stability operations side by side with the CTA campaign so that you're consolidating gains as you go and not thinking about it six to nine months later um, when terrorists that might have been pushed back by out of the area are merely embedding and waiting for an opportunity to step back in. And Ms. Dalton, do you think the review uh, adequately addresses the, how you've laid out kind of these big questions that we need to answer? I think it does in so far as the, I, I know the rigorous literature review that the team undertook in, um, that, that's behind the scenes of, of the SAR itself um, speaks to contextually examples of where we've seen this played out. So I think the principles laid out in the SAR in terms of doing the assessment, monitoring, and evaluation, ensuring that you have an anchor to clear outcomes and objectives articulated up front is a reflection of of these experiences. Um, Mr. Shop, did you want to answer? No. Mr. Cooper, do you have any additional questions? Thank you. I'd like uh, to, the, for the record, get a sense of scale from either or both of y'all. If Mr. Shop represents primarily U.S. NGOs, uh, how those compare as an aggregate versus European ones and other donor nations, uh, Japan, whatever, and also compare with what Russia or China are doing, or India, uh, that would give me a sense of scale, because it's my correct collection that actually in terms of donation and uh, kindness internationally, the U.S. government PEPFAR program is one of the largest in history, right? Multi-billion dollar effort, dwarfs most other things, and that's something the U.S. has been doing, started by the George W. Bush administration, I think, that really doesn't get the credit that perhaps it deserves. So. 
a sense of scale would be helpful. Okay, as, as mentioned before, I can get back to you with specific numbers. In terms of, of scale, I mean, PEPFAR is really a development program or a humanitarian one, but as, as you mentioned, it, yeah, it, it's, it's one of the biggest uh, that was ever, um, that were never, ever initiated, it's still continuing, and it's got incredibly positive results, and we don't really hear about that, as you, as you mentioned, as much. The U.S. government is, uh, and has been historically on the humanitarian side the biggest the biggest donor to to the humanitarian community. Um, there are th other governments, the European Union, the Scandinavians, that are also very generous uh, with uh, with humanitarian assistance. In terms of the NGO community, uh, you know the separation between between uh, Europeans and, and and U.S. entities. I think it's very, again, difficult to, to, to determine. Uh, the, the U.S. NGO sector is, is probably bigger uh, than, than uh, in the humanitarian side than the European one, but they're, they're comparable and they're the main actors. Looking to, to Russia and China, I mean, there's no, there's no non-governmental sector uh, in, in either of those countries, as, as you've mentioned, either for political reasons or, or, or other. We do uh, sometimes provide advice to, to how they can organize themselves if they want to develop that sector. Uh, and, and that's something that we do, especially on the disaster risk reduction side, as, as, as we've mentioned. But as a, as a sector, I, I, the, the Chinese uh, and the Russians are not really an entity within the humanitarian sector. Uh, as it stands. Um, so oligarchs or princelings don't have their favorite causes or charities? Or? Not to my knowledge. That's quite, that's like Sherlock Holmes' dog that didn't bark. That's a clue in and of itself. It might not be observable, but people with means should be generous. That's an astonishing gap in world generosity totals because that, you know, if Putin himself is estimated to be worth $100 billion personally, this is astonishing if there's, like, it's not like he signed up for the Bill Gates, Warren Buffett giving pledge or anything like that. Yes, Ms. Dalton. If I could, um, sir, just to comment on that. I mean, I think um, if you look more broadly at um, Russian and, and Chinese and Iranian activities in, in Syria, I think they do see a self-interested reason to be investing um, in, in reconstruction, which is beyond a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today. We're talking about the immediate response needs in the aftermath, aftermath or in uh, concurrence with conflict. Um, but I think what we're seeing is direct investments by the Russians and the Chinese uh, to, to shore up their power and influence um, and economic opportunities in, in Syria. Big difference between investment and donation. Like if you get a port or a factory or a section of a city in return, that's not exactly a charitable impulse. Exactly, sir. Thanks. Thank you our, to our panelists for being here today. Uh, this is very helpful for our purposes as we continue moving the NDAA through the conference process. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>